Um, a good day to everyone. I hope you're all well. I'm Kylie from UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, and I will be facilitating for this session. First and foremost, thank you all for joining us in today's workshop session titled A Sustainable Supply Chain, The Role of SMEs. So before we start, I would like to first highlight on a few things to all the participants. Please kindly keep your mic and camera turned off throughout the session. And for the best experience, please view this Zoom meeting in the speaker's view. So how you're able to do that is actually just click on the right box on the top, top right corner of your screen and click on speaker's view. Also, please do note that this session is recorded. And if you're having any connectivity issues, please feel free to restart by leaving the call and jumping in again. We welcome you to be interactive during this whole session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box below. I hope this is clear for everyone. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat box as well. Okay, to start, I would like to thank our knowledge partner during this session, Capital Markets Malaysia for hosting this session with us. May I pass the floor to Michelle to give a brief introduction on Capital Markets Malaysia. Thanks, Kylie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle, and I'm part of the team here at Capital Markets Malaysia. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this workshop entitled Sustainable Supply Chain, the Role of SMEs. So I'd like to thank UNGC for including Capital Markets Malaysia to be part of the SME SDG Week. CMM have led and collaborated with strategic partners to establish three centers of excellence um, to accelerate the capabilities of our industry players in ESG. So the first of these is the formation of the Center for Sustainable Cooperation. We call it the CSC. The CSC is primarily set up to help corporates improve their sustainability footprint, uh, to help you with capacity building, uh, cap capacity development within the area of sustainability and climate finance with the ultimate aim of facilitating better and engaging on ESG with your investors. <clears throat> One of the main reasons why we are running this program, which is primarily directed at SMEs, is because we know that SMEs form a vital role in the supply chain and that sustainability within the supply chain of corporations have become a paramount importance. In a report by Standard Chartered that was released um, middle of this year in June, called the Carbon, called carbon Dated, um, it highlighted the fact that nearly 73% of MNCs globally are addressing their carbon footprint very seriously. And by 2025, they are going to start transitioning to a net zero position. And the statistics shows that at least 67% of them say that most of their carbon footprint comes from their supply chain. And these MNCs are planning to address their supply chain. So in regards to this, we realize that Malaysia is the most uh, fifth most exposed market in terms of our exports uh, to these changing trends, whereby when regulations become more strict about your carbon footprint. So the report also showed that one of the main challenge supply chain emissions uh, face is the lack of knowledge and the lack of disclosures. So it was based on these two facts that Capital Markets Malaysia worked with Margie from Thought in Gear and Tobias to come up with this program. So essentially, we are trying to teach SMEs and reaching out to MNCs who have SMEs in their supply chain to understand how to recognize what carbon footprint is, how to measure your carbon footprint, and then adequately disclose it. So this helps SMEs to improve their positioning in the global supply chain and also does not jeopardize their ability to export. So today we have two speakers lined up who are experts in this field. We have Margie, uh, the CEO of Tots in Gear, uh, which is a sustainability consulting firm, and Tobias Mengelman, who's the MD of Lasaju Consulting, which is a Malaysian consulting firm focused on transforming systems for a better and more sustainable future. I hope you find this program as interesting as we hope it will be. Thank you. Kylie, I pass it back to you. 
Thank you so much, Michelle, for the insightful introduction. Um, as mentioned by Michelle earlier, our trainers for today are actually Margie and Tobias. With this, I would like to invite Margie to introduce herself to everyone and start this workshop session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kylie and Michelle. What an excellent introduction. Hello and good afternoon, everyone here. Uh, I see a few familiar names, so that's wonderful. And it is excellent to host you today. I will jump right in because we've got quite a bit we want to cover, but just a few things up front. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, please do engage. So if you do have a question, type it in the chat. And what we'll do is uh, between Tobias and myself, we'll tag team. So when one is speaking, the other will try and answer questions if it's not too distracting for each of us. So do engage with us via the chat. If there is a very pressing question, especially during the Q&A session, we will stop for two short Q&A sessions. Do feel free to unmute your mic and turn on your video so we can engage um, a little bit more interactively. Now, um, this afternoon, we will be focused on um, sustainability for SMEs, as mentioned, you are a critical part of the supply chain. Now, when we went through the list of um, registrants, we did realize that there are a few um, MNCs, GLCs and PLCs in the audience as well. And we're really, really happy you're here because, of course, your potential for impact is huge. But above and beyond that, you have deep supply chains that you are also seeking to be able to manage and calculate as well. So um, we will jump into that today. And again, please do feel free to ask questions. And with that, I will jump into our slides proper. So welcome and thank you to uh, CMM for hosting us um, here today under the Center for Sustainable Corporations. Do check it out if you haven't already. This is what we have planned today. And in between, if there are parts that you want us to dive in a little bit deeper, because it's a lot to cover, to be honest, in two hours. So if there's any part that you want us to dive in a little bit deeper, if we're kind of whizzing through it, please let me know in the chat and we will be sure to um, ponder that point a little bit longer. So there'll be two halves that we're talking about. I say half um, quite loosely because I think we'll try and spend more time on the second part and a little bit less time on the first part. But we'll basically try and cover, firstly, the why and the what of sustainability for companies in general. And the reason we're going to spend a little bit less time on that is because I think in Malaysia, hopefully, the conversation has moved um, a little bit from the why and the what to the how. And that's where we will also be focusing um, after the first Q&A session onto the how. And in the how, we're hoping to give you very actionable steps on two fronts. One, how do you even begin to adopt sustainability either in your organization or how do you influence your supply chain to be able to adopt sustainability? And secondly, which is where I will invite um, the environmental expert Tobias to come on in, is where we talk about your GHG emissions. And that's um, you know, the, the fun part about calculating your scope one, two, and three. And then we'll close off with Q&A in the second half. All right, so let's jump right in. So very quick introductions, first and foremost, um, as uh, mentioned, kindly mentioned earlier, we are Thoughts in Gear, we are a sustainability consulting firm, largely working in Malaysia, um, some engagements abroad, but mostly trying very hard to mobilize our Malaysian companies towards sustainability. I am Margie Ong, and thank you so much for joining me today. I am well supported by Kavita, a team member with lots of experience, as well as Angelina with um, lots of experience and um, knowledge as well. And for the second um, part, the second half of the second part, we will be joined by a guest speaker, Mr. Tobias Mangelman, and I will allow him to introduce himself at that time. Otherwise, I won't do him justice and his decades of experience. All right. Now, as mentioned, we have two hours together. We're going to try and make this two hours as useful as possible for you because it's your precious time and you're spending that with us. So we're going to try and really make this session useful for you. And one of the things we want to do, one easy way for us to customize this session for you is really to ask you what industry you're from. Because as you know, sustainability is very industry specific. And 
sometimes it's um, a bit of a hit and miss in terms of how well positioned you are. But even within a very challenging industry, there are ways you can position yourself extremely well. So here, we'd like to invite you to type your industry in the chat box. And this will kind of get you familiar with the chat box as well. So we'll get the questions coming. But let me ask you a question first. What industry are you from? So if you can just type your industry in the chat box, we'll do a quick scan through. And what we'll do is, as we're talking, we'll try and incorporate some examples from your industry to make it much more useful to you. All right, I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. So we've got services, halal, excellent, uh, real estate, garment, very important, reconditioning of batteries, legal construction, services, chemical. All right, keep it coming and we'll keep scanning as I carry on. All right, thank you for that. And I think, all right, it looks like manufacturing and services. All right, we'll keep, keep that coming and I will try and include as many of those examples as I can. Now, the first part of what we wanted to cover today is really why sustainability is a must for businesses today. And um, Michelle gave a little bit of a teaser in terms of how it's coming down, not just the regulatory side, but very much in terms of your potential clients out there who are facing some regulatory pressures and that will trickle down to you. But let's see how that, how that um, actually does trickle down to you. So the first question I wanted to address here is, what's the fuss all about, right? So um, especially with the backdrop of COP26, we couldn't be having this conversation at a better time. Um, and we're hearing news every day, right? So we're keeping up to date with some of the commitments that are made by all the different countries and really trying to see if this COP26 is gonna make a difference for our future or not. But truly, what is the fuss all about and why did it come about now, right? So even if you look five years ago, that, um, that activity, the level of activity was definitely nowhere near where it is today. So first and foremost, there was an increased and urgent realization that the planet cannot sustain the current level of human activity. Right, so there were obviously very scientific projections, and I think right now it's not—it's uh, no longer a question of whether if it will happen, but just a matter of when it will happen, and that's why um, countries all over the world are beginning to take a lot more urgent action. Now we'll go through um, each of the um, uh, graphs in detail, but if you're one who likes data, um, do have a look at the data that's put forth every time there's a new commitment at COP26. And I think the realization that the, the increase in emissions and the expected warming is expected to be relatively disastrous by 2100. And that is not far away. It is in the lifetime of our children and our children's children as well. And so um, if we do not act, it will, there are obviously different scenarios that have been portrayed. So one, why the fuss? Because this realization suddenly came about and the momentum was gained that we cannot do things the way we are currently. And as Elon Musk said, we are running the most dangerous experiment in history right now, which is to see how much carbon dioxide the atmosphere can handle before there is an environmental catastrophe. The second reason, why there is a fuss at this point is because there is increased clarity on the inequity and suffering of the humankind. So across the world, there has been, obviously we are one of the most, well, we are the most connected and informed society in the world, in the history of the world. And we've got information at our fingertips. So there's been increased clarity, hopefully increased transparency, not always, on the inequity of mankind. And so we saw the first rise in 20 years, unfortunately, on the projected number of people living in extreme poverty in the world. And this obviously was unfortunately brought about by the tragedy of COVID. And right now, which is something that is critically important to, to many, many of you, especially those who keyed in earlier that you're um, within the manufacturing environment, that there are currently in the world over 40 million that are people who are what is called to be enslaved in the modern uh, slavery trade. And if this is the first 
time you're hearing the term modern slavery, it might sound rather jarring, which it definitely did for me. Um, but this covers basically instances of forced labor. And you'd be quite surprised that, you know, forced labor does not necessarily mean, um, you know, literally chaining someone to their work desk. But um, there are many, many implications of this, as we have seen in our own uh, companies in Malaysia. So if you did keep up with the news, so for example, um, just last week alone, the fifth rubber glove company from Malaysia has been banned by the US Customs and Border Patrol for instances of labor rights violations. And that's, that's extremely significant for the company and it definitely has business continuity issues. So this is um, definitely on the radar of Malaysian um, companies in general, but definitely those involved, deeply involved in manufacturing. And the third reason why there is a fuss is because there is currently an increased demand for ethical and transparent organizations. And this includes um, everything from, you know, something as light as, let's say, um, you know, being misrepresented in the press, for which they are being held accountable for, to we see high instances of greenwashing at the moment. So do be careful of that, because if you are a company, and I do encourage you to ingrain sustainability in your comms message, be very, very careful within the guidelines of which that you do not um, inevitably fall into the realm of greenwashing. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on in our conversation. But also it goes to the extremes of the more serious, which is around corruption, for example. So there are um, there are, have been very high instances of um, companies that are dealing with corruption internally. And so that uh, has definitely been um, in focus as well of late all over the world. Now, if you realize these three categories that I've mentioned fall uh, quite conveniently, actually I designed it that way, into three categories. One is the environmental category. Secondly is the social category. And thirdly is the governance category, right? And that is our first um, definition of the day. So really having you understand the acronym of ESG. Right? environmental, social, and governance. And I will cover later, and I'll be very disappointed if nobody asks me what the difference is between sustainability and ESG, but I will cover that a little bit later. So that falls into the realm of what we're talking about here today, ESG. And why the, so with all this recognition and realization, why did this fuss then come on down to corporations like yourselves as well? because the world truly sat up and took notice that these things were happening and that they were in fact quite unacceptable. So first we had uh, for the first time um, you know, in recent history, the whole world agreeing on a set of goals of where we need to head to as a planet. And you're probably well familiar with this colorful diagram with the 17 SDG goals. We then had um, the Paris Agreement in 2015 in COP21. And so now we're looking towards COP26 to see how far we've come. Um, well, spoiler alert, we've not come as far as we should have. So let's keep a keen eye on this one. And of course, the third one that has come down, especially on the private sector side, are science-based targets. Now, um, Tobias will talk a lot more about this later on, but science-based targets were basically introduced to ensure that private companies all over the world, if we aggregate our impact as private corporations, will this achieve what we need to achieve for the planet? And that's where um, you know you'll see all the and you know if you're a little bit of a nerd for data, do go in and have a poke around because it's extremely interesting to see which companies have made what commitments as well. All right, so that answers hopefully the question of what the fuss is all about. All right, so next question. Now that I know what the fuss is about and why the fuss is being made. Um, one note that we do want to leave this question with is that, to be very, very honest, amongst us today, the you know 50 odd of us here, 
the why might not resonate as much with all companies. You know, you'll have obviously companies are made up of individuals. Individuals are made up of, um, you know, very different construct, right? Each and every one of us. This why might resonate extremely, um, uh, you know, heavily with some of the folks in the audience today. And you might think, oh my gosh, you know, we have to do something in order to secure, um, you know, resources for the future generation. But some of you in the audience might be, yes, that's extremely important, but I am dealing with other priorities at the moment. I'm struggling as a company. I just came out of COVID or I'm dealing with other regulatory issues or I'm barely trying to keep my own company afloat. Regardless of whether or not this why resonates with you, you need to know that it is coming your way. So even if you don't inherently, um, you know, either believe or feel compelled to act um, with the, these reasons, you need to know that there are uh, there are currently regulations in the world that are going to be taking care of this. And as a result of that, those regulations and requirements from other companies are going to come very heavily to you um, sooner rather than later. Now, speaking of those different stakeholders that are concerned, that brings us to the second question. And the second question that I wanted to address is really, okay, that's the fuss, but who's actually looking out for it? So besides those of you here, um, the wonderful 50 odd people who came to seek the knowledge, um, who else is looking for it? And why should you be concerned or um, you know, relatively um, aware, if not alarmed by, the, by kind of the buzz that's going on um, globally and locally as well? So mainly here, we've grouped the people or your key stakeholders who are looking out for it into six main categories, all right? And I'm gonna cover each of them in um, a little bit more detail. So first and foremost, governments. Governments, um, obviously, um, as I mentioned, with the backdrop of COP26, governments are actively looking out for it, I would say, but the reason I'm saying that very hesitantly is because um, obviously there is that balance between economic growth as well as um, the, the emissions um, reduction. And we see that every day in the conversations that are coming out of COP26, right? And the ability or inability to make those commitments as well. But suffice to say, it has been increasing exponentially and these numbers were actually from pre-COP26. So this is before the new commitments were made. And these are the number of national net zero pledges. You would have heard of that. And share of the global carbon dioxide emissions covered, right? So the only thing you need to take away from this graph is the fact that the number of pledges and regulations across the world in terms of number of countries and you know each of those uh, bar increases a number of countries have either introduced them into law or they have proposed a bill or it's in policy documents at the moment and um, as you'd see in the last three years you know when COVID first struck um, it really wasn't apparent which way we would go in terms of sustainability whether that would take a back seat um, due to the the health crisis or whether it would speed up. And I think we've seen in the last two years that it has been the latter because more and more people are seeing that very, very tight knit and close relationship that these um, that planetary health has, right? With all these um, different environmental pledges as well. Now, um, in terms of, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with what a net zero pledge is. Um, but I will hold that definition for Tobias and, um, and let him kind of get into more detail in terms of what a either a national or a corporate net zero pledge is. And that's incredibly important to you because as you know, we also have large companies locally that have made net zero pledges, which is excellent, but how does that affect you, all right? The other um, interesting note that we wanted to bring forward, so there were so many, many examples, right, in terms of governments that we could have showcased, but we thought this was quite a significant development that we wanted to highlight to all of you. 
And this is when EU proposed the world's first carbon border tax for imports. So if Europe is one of your current export markets, you do want to take note of that. The carbon border tax will take effect in 2026, but as of 2023, they will begin to require reporting um, as you cross their borders. Now, the whole, um, you know, one of the things that the worry is with the carbon tax for places like Malaysia is the fact that our exports will become a lot less competitive price wise because. Um, as we know, Europe would be far ahead um, in terms of their carbon emissions or their reduction of carbon emissions. So they um, potentially become a much more favorable market to their own local market at that point in time. And because of the carbon border tax, that might actually impact our pricing uh, competitiveness. So something to just look out for. Take away from this slide, there has been significant acceleration in net zero emissions pledges announced by governments. So do keep an eye on that with an increasing number enshrined in law. And I would encourage you not just to look at the Malaysian um, pledges and, um, and policies, but also look around the world in terms of where it's developing because that is just a matter of time before it comes down to Asia. All right, the next stakeholder we wanted to talk about was definitely your investors, right? So in, in terms of the investor realm, why or who is actually looking out for your ESG performance? Now, Bloomberg Intelligence has already released amongst the many, many data points that they've released. They have said that ESG assets are on track to hit more than a third of global AUM by 2025, and that is just slightly more than three years away, right? So more and more, and this is um, basically dedicated ESG assets. Those that are not dedicated ESG assets, as some of you might have seen, also have ESG screenings in place at the moment. And um, so some of you might have been more exposed than others, especially those with foreign investors in terms of whether it is this humongous spreadsheet that you're receiving in order to declare your data or whether it is, um, and we were very encouraged actually uh, last month to hear that analysts locally in Malaysia are beginning to ask a lot of ESG questions during your quarterly briefings. So be prepared for that as well. Asia is still very much at the beginning of, your, of our sustainable investment journey with the trend only having great gained traction over the past two years. However, even though this is a much smaller base, Asia is seeing much faster growth. And we're, we're currently chasing Europe and the US in terms of being able to set uh, ESG screenings in place. I won't go into the numbers. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, and later on I'll introduce even more uh, acronyms, so be prepared. But in this alphabet soup of standards and um, certifications and policies that we have, there is, uh, for the investor world, there is a very, very key um, signatory body, and it's called UNPRI, which is United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Now, the UNPRI holds investors responsible for their portfolio of companies and the ESG performance of their portfolio companies as a signatory to UNPRI. And the, the number of signatories have just risen exponentially as well. As a signatory of UNPRI, all investors are expected after the first honeymoon year to produce a report detailing what their portfolio companies are doing and how they are performing. All right, so having said that, um, besides all the foreign investors that you are already exposed to, and you might have heard of UNPRI, locally to our shores, we have 12 Malaysian signatories to UNPRI. And these are the 12 that I've listed here. So if any of these are uh, your investors at the moment, either you would already have have heard from them or be prepared to hear from them in order to account for your ESG performance as well. All right. And 
mind you, um, do not, if, you know, if this is the first year hearing of it, um, you know, uh, do not be exceptionally overwhelmed because this is just the first half, the why and the what, right? So later on the second half, will completely demystify the how and show you that, you know, um, being able to get on board is really uh, not as intimidating as many, many companies would imagine that it is, especially SMEs, right? Which is why we're here today. So here, of course, I have to start with the very compelling reasons and the motivation to get you interested in the second half of the actual doing and the actions involved. So who else is looking out for it? So the third very large and very key stakeholder who's looking out for it are other companies, right? And these companies could make up your supply chain um, as well. Now, uh, Michelle has mentioned this standard charted report called Carbon Dated. I would highly encourage you to have a, have a read of it. And even if you pick out just the visuals, it's, it's, um, it's, very, it's, it's a very key report that many countries are going by at the moment. And one of the things that it says within the report is that 78% of MNCs, and I know we have MNCs in the audience today as well, are planning to cut suppliers by 2025 for impacting their carbon reduction goals. So if you think about this from a holistic perspective, I just mentioned that, you know, a lot of companies are being held, um, you know, their feet are being held to the fire in terms of reducing their own carbon footprint, right? Now their own carbon footprint, as you'll hear from Tobias later on in, in the session, their own carbon footprint is made up of um, the carbon footprint, not just of what they are doing and what they are producing, but up and down their supply chain. So that includes if your client is an MNC and you're an SME, that includes you as well. Now, acknowledging and knowing now that they've calculated their carbon footprint and they know that, okay, my suppliers make up a very big part of my carbon footprint. What is one of the easiest, unfortunately, one of the easiest ways for them to reduce their carbon footprint is simply to swap out their suppliers. So picking a lower carbon emissions supplier. So let's say a cement manufacturer, for example, commodity like for like product, ideally quality wise, one has lower um, emissions numbers and the other one has higher emissions numbers. If I buy from the lower emissions numbers, that then reduces my own carbon footprint. So that's kind of the, um, the logic behind what Standard Chartered is coming, is, is, is coming at. And here, as we can see, unfortunately, the annual export revenue, and that includes, so you think about it, these numbers are very macro, right? But each and every country, their annual export revenue is made up of folks like you, right? So every number is made up of SMEs or PLCs who are exporting and therefore making up these billions of dollars, but your dollars could potentially be within that as well. We've just highlighted the three Southeast Asian countries that are affected with us also largely being affected. And so we wanted to make sure, and this is part of the effort today by CMM and by us, to really mobilize Malaysian companies so that we are not at risk to really remove ourselves from this risk factor that we're seeing. So take away from the slide, racing against their clock to hit their net zero carbon goals, MNCs are increasing the pressure on their suppliers to become more sustainable in less than three and a half years. In fact, I prepared this slide uh, about a month or two ago. In fact, now it's much less than three and a half years. It's just slightly over three years, right? So who else is looking out for it? We mentioned financial institutions. I'll go through this slightly quicker. Um, I, won't, I won't go into the details, but similar to UNPRI, the principles for investors, there is one for banks as well. And locally, there are um, two banks that have signed up, which are CIMB and Bank Pembangunan. Now, besides the banks that have signed up for UNPRB and are therefore introducing ESG screening, many, many banks, both locally and abroad, are now actually screening for ESG from two different points of view. One, ensuring that their portfolio has a lower carbon footprint, but also secondly, on the positive side, if you have um, a higher ESG uh, performance and you're doing much better in ESG, 
you do actually stand to gain um, financial financing benefits as well, even in terms of rates. And we have verified this with a few banks. Talent. Um, by 2025, millennials will account for approximately 75% of your overall workforce. And even though, uh, you know, this is a survey, so the 50% I would take with a pinch of salt, but 50% of this pool have actually stated that they would consider quitting if they were made an offer by a more environmentally responsible company. And if you've been recruiting in the workforce, um, I think you might have might have seen, um, and we have heard from companies who have seen uh, candidates who are actually asking and um, not just asking about ESG performance, not all of them are kind of um, asking that particular question, but really asking about the purpose of the company and the impact that you are having on the world um, as a company. The final group and maybe the most compelling group um, oftentimes are consumers, right? So we have much more informed uh, pool of consumers at the moment. And even though the cancel culture probably hasn't hit our shores yet, um, but very much consumers are looking for purpose-based company. Like for like um, pricing, sustainability definitely sells. And in fact, Unilever has um, announced their results to say, because they have a whole suite of businesses, their purpose-based businesses are trending to much higher growth numbers than their non-purpose-based businesses. All right. So that's who actually is looking out for it, right? So we've covered, um, in this first section, we've covered two main questions. What's all the fuss about? Who's looking out for it? And now I really want to turn the spotlight back to you, right? So the question you might have is, okay, um, you know, I'm sufficiently informed or alarmed, whichever way you want to go, but what's in it for me? Like, um, you know, besides either it being a risk factor for your business that you want to do it, um, or there are actually opportunities in it, like why, why would you want to go down the sustainability route, right? So here, there is, we've placed three main value levers along this um, span of uh, opportunities that range from all the way through to being a very real threat to your business, to it being an extremely, hopefully profitable opportunity for your business as well. And you will find, you will hopefully find um, areas along this entire range of threat and opportunity that actually relate to you. So it's not one or the other, but both that are extremely relevant to every company here. All right, and these we have broken down, or not we, but London Business School has broken down into three main value levers, all right? And the value levers are, the first value lever is about reducing risks. So truly the ability to stay in business and the ability to be competitive. The second value lever is about increasing profits your ability to improve margins and your ability to improve market terms as well. And the third area is about unlocking growth opportunities, your ability to differentiate and your ability to innovate as well. Now let's take these one by one, okay? So first and foremost, reducing risk. Now, hopefully from the first part of my presentation, you have guarded that, you know, there might be some risk to my business based on all these developments around the world and all the different stakeholders that are now looking at me, right? And so the first, um, there are five main risks that we want to talk about that are both a risk for your ability to stay in business, but also your ability to be competitive in future. The first is physical risk. So this is relatively straightforward. So this goes to um, the most tangible risk, which is the risk to your assets. So basically assets that, for example, lie in areas that climate change will directly affect. Right? The second risk is existential risk. And this, um, and that's part of the reason why we had asked for your industry earlier on, this is relatively um, confined to certain industries as well. So assets in several sectors, 
risk becoming stranded assets. And if you are in those sectors, um, do keep an eye out and ensure that your business pivot strategy is definitely in place. So definitely call, and that's coming out of COP26, a very, very strong uh, topic of conversation at the moment. You want, might want to pay attention to that. Oil, uh, oil and gas for sure. Um, auto, aviation, and construction might also want to look out for that. We did see some of those in the audience today. Transitional risk. Now, this is very interesting, and it's something that you could potentially plan for in your scenario planning. So business models do indeed have to change. So as an example, in this transition, even though you your company in and of itself might not be as directly affected, there are other companies that are being affected and they are um, in turn transforming, which means that you would have to transform your business model as well. So as an example quoted here, transport, for example, do they the EVs are coming down the way and we know that. So um, they will shift to zero emission vehicles. And how does that affect the transportation companies as well? Regulatory risk, we've spoken quite a bit about that um, at the moment, that regulation is coming down the way. And so even if companies do not voluntarily work towards low carbon targets, regulations will force the issue. And we've already kind of given an example of how that could be costly as well. Now, the very real risk that we have also seen um, in the market is reputational risk. And I think this is something that is to some extent within your influence and your control. And um, so you do want to be very aware of your reputational risks if you do not go down the sustainability route. So overall, I just wanted to highlight the risks that ideally, if anyone's from risk assessment and management here in the audience, that you do want to ensure that sustainability risks are taken alongside um, all the other risks that you have on your, uh, on your risk register as well. All right, next up, increasing profits. Now, this is the very real ability to improve margins and the ability to improve market terms, right? So this mainly comes in the category of efficiencies. So eco-efficiencies um, are something that, to be very honest, when we start out with companies, we say, try and look for an eco-efficiency project because number one, um, you it will be much, much easier to run this by your CFO because it ha does have ideally a positive, um, a, a positive effect on the bottom line, either short or midterm um, effect, but it is one of the areas that would be relatively um, easier to make a business case for. So some of the areas of eco-efficiency include energy, water, paper, virgin material, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the second point about the ability to improve market terms, I mentioned just now when I talked about financial institutions, it has been proven to reduce the cost of capital, increase operational performance, of course, because you're looking at um, high productivity, high efficiencies, and it does increase um, share price performance as well. All right. Now I'm glossing over all of these, but do take each and every one of these value levers and um, study them and really give them much longer thought than I am covering them at the moment because I'm rushing for time. So unlocking growth opportunities. This is, so we've gone from risk, you know, very doom and gloom, be worried, be scared, be very, very scared. And we've gone to efficiencies where, okay, you know, there might be some, um, you know, few margin points for me in this um, in in this uh, journey. So it might be worthwhile. I might, you know, break even from a project perspective. But truly, this is where it gets exciting. So the third value lever is about unlocking growth opportunities, and this talks to the ability to differentiate. As in, you know, I mentioned earlier the two companies, like for light, one with a lower uh, carbon footprint for example, and the ability to innovate. So in this world of looking for much more efficient ways of, um, of producing the same goods that we all need, you will find that there have been many, many, many instances, and we have many examples of companies that are able to take advantage of these opportunities, right? So in terms of differentiation, as I mentioned, MNCs are willing to spend more on net zero products in the realm of innovation, 
look towards areas that you can very proactively contribute to or leverage in this sustainability journey. And typically three quick and easy ways to kind of get started is one, really rediscovering your purpose as a company. So, you know, when you were founded as a company, every company is founded to, to plug a gap in society, to solve a societal problem. So rediscover your purpose and ensure that that's at the core of your business strategy. I'm not talking about sustainability strategy, but your business strategy process. So really look at your innovation planning process. Innovation um, you know, can be spontaneous, but does not need to be ad hoc. Um, partnerships, build strong external networks and work very collaboratively. And you'll find that there have been a number of associations, et cetera, in the marketplace that have been set up to enable this sector collaboration, which is very key as well. So that very quickly covers just my first um, uh, agenda item. I'm going to go quickly into the three things every company needs to know, and then I'm going to pause for a uh, first half Q&A before I jump into eight simple steps, and then I'll hand to Tobias. All right. So very quickly, again, I do want to customize this session for you. So if I may ask you to respond to a poll, and I'm going to launch it now and read it together with you. It's a multiple choice question, so you can select as many as is applicable to you, yeah? So the question is, what are some of your company's biggest obstacles in adopting sustainability today? And I'll share your answers, um, aggregated answers back to you so that we know what the rest of the people are thinking in the room, all right? So first, we don't see the need to, no board or senior management buy-in, no clear ownership of sustainability in my company, benefits or returns are not obvious to me, high cost or investment perceived to be required to start, or we have the will where all systems go, but we do not know the way. So let me know, um, it's a multiple choice question, so pick as many as is applicable to you. And I'll just give you a few more seconds to fill that in, and then I will share the results. All right, five seconds, four, three, get them in. <laughs> Excellent, it's rushing. Two, one, all right, that's it. It's always this big rush at the end with buttons. Okay, so here we go. So this is what all of you feel, and um, I'm very happy to see that very few of you don't see the need to. And um, if you are at that point, I don't blame you. Um, you know, you are probably fighting a lot of different priorities at the moment. And, um, you know, over time, you might or you might not uh, see the need to. Board and senior management buy-in. And I do, we've run this poll for about a year and a half now. And that number has, I'm so happy to say, come that smaller and smaller, that bar. Originally, when we ran the poll, that was probably the highest, no board or senior management buy-in. So now you're probably getting more pressure from your senior management than anything else. So the highest one here are um, benefits or returns are not obvious and no clear ownership. So hopefully in the next section, when we talk about the how, including um, you know, having the will, but not knowing the way, hopefully we will address some of these obstacles. So it looks like a lot more of the obstacles are focused on the how, and that's why I will very quickly now try and finish this why and what session, section so that we can get into the how. All right, three quick things every company needs to know. What is corporate sustainability? What are the current regulations? And what guidance is available? All right, what is corporate sustainability? All right, nobody asked me, or I haven't checked the chat, so they might have. Um, nobody asked me what the difference between sustainability and ESG is. So sustainability has many, many definitions. All right, we like this very generic uh, definition that says, it is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. What does that mean in your company? That means it is the sustainability cuts across your company and it does not just mean making sure that um, we have a healthy forest. It means that your business continues to sustain and endure through the ages for the decades to come, that your company is well set up to be able to sustain in the future. And that's what sustainability is. Now, 
in the realm of um, definitions, sustainability is largely, um, so, you know, as I mentioned, the ability, your ability to sustain and your capacity to endure. It is largely defined into four broad categories. And when I mention them, they will become familiar to you. So economic, environmental, social, and governance, right? If you look at these four broad categories, there are two acronyms that most likely you would have seen. So in the Bursa Sustainability Reporting Guide version 2.0, you would have seen the term EES, right? Economic, environmental, and social. And many of your annual reports, I'm sure, sustainability reports, are structured according to the EES categories, all right? And that's great, and that's absolutely fine. And in layman terms, that's the triple bottom line or the three Ps, profit, planet, people, all right? And oftentimes when we talk about the EES term, governance, the G, is usually included in the first E, all right? Now, the other term that I've used this morning as well, and that you hear very much, especially in the investor world, is ESG. ESG covers environmental social governance, as you know, and the reason it covers these three and not the first E is because it covers your non-financial disclosures. And this in the investor world sits right next to your very standardized financial disclosures, right? So now there are two realms in the investor world that's being scrutinized, your financial disclosures and your non-financial disclosures. In the near future, hopefully these two will merge to become one. But at the moment, your ESG is defined as your non-financial disclosures, all right? Now... What is corporate sustainability? I will introduce this very quickly due to time. We usually spend a lot more time on the wave, but I do want to encourage you to go ahead and read it up. Um, it's definitely out there in the public sphere. And what it does is it basically categorizes all companies in the world into five key stages of sustainability adoption, all the way from pre-compliance, either intentionally or not, not being compliant, being compliant, beyond compliance, and um, stage four is where it gets integrated into your company strategy. And stage five is where sustainability truly is the purpose and the passion of your business, and it drives profitability. You are not a nonprofit organization. Um, and sorry, I assume I'm speaking to corporates here, but I'm sure there are nonprofits in the audience we've seen as well. Um, but these are organizations or companies that are truly driven by purpose and passion. And in the corporate world today, there are, um, even globally, there are not many that can uh, fall into stage five as of yet. So I do encourage you to place yourself be very honest with yourself or with your company as you're having internal discussions. Place yourself on this wave. Where are you today? Where do you want to get to? What is your aspiration like? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But also, how fast do you want to get there? All right. Next uh, point on what you need to know, what are the current regulations? And here I'll just cover three very quickly, which is the first one, which many of you, especially if you're listed in Malaysia, um, you are well aware of, which is making sustainability reporting mandatory. So Bursa Malaysia has, and it is um, in full effect for the last three years, all companies on the stock exchange is being um, regulated under the listing requirements that has very specific components. Uh, we're not going through today, but we have a 40 point checklist to really be very clear about what is required from a compliance perspective in your sustainability reporting. And spoiler alert, many, many companies are not quite compliant, but at the moment, um, you know, and that is uh, slowly but surely being more and more scrutinized by Bursa with each year that the sustainability report is, um, is getting published. And as a public listed company, you might also have received your report card from Bursa in terms of how you performed in your sustainability reporting. Um, next up, and this is for about a quarter of the stock exchange at the moment, that you're being evaluated by FTSE Russell under a, uh, an ESG index called FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia. And FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia is something that is run by Bursa, run very well since 2014. 
and it is um, it's being it's not an opt-in or an opt-out program. If you have more questions, ask me in the chat. Otherwise, I won't go into too much detail. But it's fascinating um, that uh, we have this as publicly available information now in terms of how 235 companies have uh, have ranked in these evaluations. And of course, from Securities Commission, we have the SRI roadmap. We also have MCCG, um, April 2021, that many of you might be familiar with. And besides these, we also have, for example, the um, MACC guidelines as well, Section 17A. So just to highlight that there are current regulations in place and ensuring that you are in full compliance. Now, what guidance is available? And I think this is quite important to all of you. Um, we are here for a two hour webinar. There's no way this is enough information to get you started, um, but I do wanna point you to places where you can get more information. Now, in terms of guidance, there are two main frameworks that would be applicable to you. On one hand, there are reporting frameworks. And in the other bucket, there are evaluation frameworks. So reporting frameworks, are frameworks that guide you on how and what to report. I promised you an alphabet soup of standards and here they are. So um, Bursa does recommend GRI and we also um, strongly recommend GRI, one of the most popular reporting frameworks in the world. TCFD is one of the newer um, uh, guys on the block, but very much gaining ground, the fastest gaining ground. So do have a look at TCFD. SASB is um, another standard that you could follow. CDP is um, age old and very, very popular and important as well, but focused on climate. And of course, I've mentioned science-based targets already. Now on the, in the other bucket, evaluation frameworks are frameworks. So if you think about reporting frameworks, they're next to you, they're holding your hand, they're guiding you. This is what you need to talk about. This is what you need to indicators that you need to track. This is how you would indicate progress, et cetera. Evaluation frameworks are there to judge you. So they're there to see how well or not well you're doing from an ESG performance perspective. So here locally, as mentioned, we go, we're going with FTSE for good. For example, Singapore goes with Dow Jones Sustainability Index, MSCI rates big companies all over the world. So you can also see some of our large companies um, being graded on MSCI as well, and then there's Sustainalytics, Robico Sam, and so on and so forth, and many more. Um, now, these frameworks, having put out the many, many standards out there, it is uh, if you are looking for guidance and you have limited resources and uh, focus and ability to focus, I would encourage you in the reporting frameworks to look at start with GRI, look at TCFD, and ideally move into science based targets. From an evaluation framework perspective, if you are listed in Malaysia, I would encourage you to look at FTSE for good and the indicators against FTSE for good. Now, I must apologize if you hear the thunder in the background, it is storming outside my window. Um, all right, so these are, so just some guidelines in terms of where to go after this webinar, right? Okay, now one of the things I wanted to highlight is very much, do not think that you're doing this, you're starting from scratch, you're doing this on your own, it's definitely not the case because with sustainability comes a little bit more transparency, comes a host of disclosures, right? So this is an area that you can get more information, even if it's a matter of thinking about your biggest competitor and opening up their last sustainability report to see how they did, to researching best practices around the world, looking at um, you know, model companies, it is an area that you can actually look towards other companies. And I love this quote, it says, when people tell me they've learned from experience, I tell them the trick is to learn from other people's experience. And on that note, a couple of quick case studies that I wanted to introduce, if I have the time. I will not talk in detail, but after the webinar, do look up a company called Deso. There are there's some, um, actually there's, there are not too many, maybe about um, three or four uh, research documents that actually track their case study. And Deso is a carpet company that was on the verge of bankruptcy. And they had gone through about three or four CEOs and the new CEO at that time decided, you know, we've Truly, we truly need some innovation in the company. We need to do something different or we're toast. Um, and he decided to adopt the cradle to cradle concept. And this was in the 
1990s, I think it was 1996, and it's now one of the most successful carpet companies in the world. They went from a linear economy to a circular economy. And his most famous quote is that waste is food for new products. And here I'm just gonna run a quick one and a half minute video for you to hear about Deso. Millions of square meters of worn out carpet are thrown away every year, often being dumped at landfill sites. Early 2008, Deso, a leading manufacturer of high quality carpet tiles and broadloom, took revolutionary steps to ensure that carpets can be safely recycled. Inspired by nature's continuous cycle, Deso bears the true identity of the cradle to cradle philosophy. Deso offers clients a take back program to ensure that products will be recycled according to the cradle to cradle principles. Products will be taken back by Deso after their useful life and will be safely recycled into new carpet products or used in other recycling initiatives. Besides its own products, Deso also encourages international collection of all types of used carpet, except for carpet containing PVC. These carpet products are recycled using Deso's innovative separation technique called Refinity. This makes it possible to separate the carpet fibers from the backing, producing two material streams which can each be recycled. The carpet fibers are returned to the yarn manufacturer for production of new yarn. For Polymide 6 yarn, this process takes place at Aquafil, one of Deso's yarn suppliers. Aquafil has developed a proprietary technology at its regeneration plant to turn recovered post-consumer polyamide 6 carpet fibers into polyamide 6 again and again. And today's bitumen backing is used in the road and roofing industry. Fractions from felt-backed tiles are currently being used as secondary fuel, for instance, in the cement industry. Cradle-to-cradle -cradle design is inspired by nature and sees carpet as being made up of nutrients that should consistently remain in use in an unending cycle. And one of the reasons I want really, oops, one of the reasons I really wanted to highlight that case study is to really highlight to you. Now, if your opinion or your image of ESG or sustainability is about planting a tree, you're not wrong. And that's extremely important, but it has taken so, such a much greater significance within your company as well, that it truly does take innovation within your company to be able to not just um, meet the guidelines, but be able to leverage and take advantage of it from a business perspective. Some very quick uh, case studies here. In the UK, there is a stationary provider that has any of you read up. I'm just kind of throwing things out that you can follow up and read up on later. Um, they have increased sales and profits by differentiating themselves because they're now a sustainable supplier. And there are there is a market looking for sustainable suppliers at the moment. Rainbow Freight Group was very interesting because they originally introduced this new um, initiative for commercial reasons. They wanted to uh, they wanted to optimize their night freight service. And so they have this, uh, it's quite fascinating when you read about it, they have this multi-user service where they share trucks, for example, and it's uh, definitely increased efficiency and productivity, but very much also it has a positive effect on the level of carbon emissions of their entire fleet. To our shores, uh, much closer to home in Malaysia, just two examples I wanted to highlight. So um, WCT, for example, launched a green technology adoption program. They collaborated with Monash. And now what they do is they are able to reuse existing asphalt, um, reclaim the existing asphalt, the old road, as they are looking to build new road or new pavements. They're actually using the, um, the old road that is dug up as part of the process instead of incurring the cost and the environmental impact of having to cart away that waste, which they used to have to do. So that was um, really innovative and a win-win. Now, mind you, you will not always be able to find win-win situations, um, but do search for them. One more close to home example, a small change with a big impact. My News initiated a business process amendment. So across its retail chain, all it did was ask its cashiers, and I've seen this actually uh, when I went to buy stuff, um, is to ask its cashiers to ask the customer, do you need your credit card paper slip? And if you don't, they don't print it out. So that um, obviously has an impact on their uh, paper wastage, but above and beyond that, um, procurement is also very happy because they now actually uh, need to buy less uh, credit card rolls. 
And apparently that is a huge logistical nightmare as well. So um, just some very quick examples to get you thinking in terms of what could be applicable within your industry. Now, I'm going to pause um, for Q&A, and I'm going to warn you, I'm not going to spend very much time, unfortunately, because I still have another section to cover before I hand over to Tobias, and I have promised him that I'll hand over to him at 3.20. So I've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I will see if there are any critical questions that have not yet been answered. Um, no, but there's some really good uh, commentary in there. All right, I'll definitely uh, read that after, after the, the webinar, thank you. So any questions, please feel free to type in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just gonna plow on. All right, um, I'm gonna pause for a moment to see if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question. Anybody? Going once, twice, three times. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I do hear. Hi, Kyril. Hi, Kyril. Okay, actually, I put my question in the in the chat, but never mind. Uh, just uh, share with the rest. Uh, let's say we take Deso as example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very good, in fact, uh, recycle uh, of their carpet. But uh, I've been curious actually uh, along the way when I saw the, the statistic about uh, recycling compared to the producing new one in terms of carbon footprint. Which one better, actually? That's, uh, I, Gary, it sounds like you have been reading up in this area, and, and that takes the conversation. I'm so happy. It takes the conversation to a whole different level. Thanks for asking. Because, uh, so, you know, Kyra is asking a really good question that applies to every every part of whether it's production here, new versus recycled, for example. And I'll leave that question for Tobias in the environmental section but very much around the, um, uh, the, the entire life cycle assessment of a product or an initiative that you're running. So for example, um, what's a very relatable example? So for example, when we go for um, you know, reuse versus, uh, for example, single use tissue paper versus washable um, washcloths, right? So oftentimes, I'm trying to pick a very simple, relatable example. So oftentimes the question is around the production of, um, of a finite, um, of a finite resource, for example, tissue paper, versus the environmental impact of the soap, the electricity in the washing machine and the washing of the cloth in order to avoid um, the usage of, um, you know, whether a potentially, uh, a potentially um, renewable source. So really being able to look at, and I think Carol's question is excellent in bringing us into the mindset of a, uh, the entire, if you've heard of LCA, the life cycle assessment, really looking at a product from end to end. And um, Tobias, especially with his recent um, work in plastics, will be able to talk uh, much more deeper on that. So I will keep that question for him as well. Thanks for that, Cairo. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I'm gonna plow ahead. I have about 10 minutes to cover this next section and then I'll hand over to Tobias. So here we're now stepping into the how, all right? So we've got, um, we've covered the why and the what and the examples and the case studies. Now truly, okay, I'm gonna assume all of you are convinced um, and you wanna go in the next step. What do you do? So if you are ready, whether you want to or whether you have to, what do you do, right? So here, I wanna introduce a simple methodology. Well, in my mind, it's simple. Let me know what you think. But before I do that, I'd really, again, like to customize this session for you. So allow me to run another poll, relatively easy poll, and it is a multiple choice question. And the question is the area of most interest now in sustainability. It's a multiple choice question. So if you have more than one area of interest, let me know. And what I'll do, because the next section is exactly divided into these categories, and I'll spend a little bit more time based on your selection. So first is how to get started. Second is how to strategize and plan your sustainability efforts. Third is how to measure and track your sustainability efforts. And fourth is how to report. All right, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, end poll. 
All right, so many, many of you would like to know how to strategize and plan your sustainability efforts. Excellent. Um, and um, some of you on measuring and tracking, reporting and getting started is quite well distributed. Okay, so I will spend, um, I will spend time accordingly. Thank you very much for your participation. All right, now to jump into the framework, okay. The, we call it the Sustainer Data Framework, and it's a framework that Thoughts and Gear has put in place, and it has been introduced to more than 100 companies now through Bursa, and we are actively promoting a simple methodology towards sustainability adoption. It's an eight-step sustainability adoption that is divided into four key phases, all right? Very simple phases. The first phase, is the no phase, okay? So in the sustainable data framework, the first phase says that we need, and regardless of where you are in your adoption, the first phase is about knowing. So the two steps within knowing, first is about creating, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in each of these if I have the time. Um, the first step is really about the awareness. So awareness, yes, at board and management level, but all the way through the organization because ultimately sustainability will touch every single department. So if you think of, for example, your, um, your HSC, right, your health and safety, it has a champion in every department and it touches every single department. Similarly, sustainability initiatives will cut across your company business units as well. It's not, um, you know, it's not in silo as a sustainability team, but they rely on the rest of the company. So creating that awareness is extremely important. Next is setup. And this is mainly um, two key actions to take here. And I'll go into a little bit more detail after this is mentioned. Governance structure as well as baseline. The second phase after knowing, which many of you asked about, is the planning stage, right? So really about um, putting in place a strategy. I've been asked many times, is this a sustainability strategy or is this a company-wide strategy? Now, what I would say is if you're starting out and you need to have a well-confined sustainability strategy, that's absolutely fine. And you your sustainability strategy is now focused on probably a little bit more tactical areas, for example, energy efficiency and being able to tackle these at an initiative level. Over time, you will begin to see, especially when you put together a materiality matrix, you will begin to see this being, um, being almost uh, a shadow of your company strategy. And slowly, ideally, these two become one and the same. The actions behind it, so there are some very key prescriptive actions like um, your materiality assessment. So very, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to that phase in a minute. So now that you know, now that you've planned, you need to do. And in the do, it is about implementation. It's about tracking. Very, very keen eye for details and data gathering. And finally, and very, very importantly, is the tell. So when you know and you plan and you've done, you now need to tell that story. You need to be able to tell it in a way that is relatable to the rest of the industry, that it is standardized so that you truly get credit for what you're doing in the company. And you know we've run workshops, as I mentioned, for more than 100 companies in Malaysia, and we have seen, and sometimes it's, it's, it's truly frustrating because the company is doing a lot internally. Two, two areas. One, they know they're doing a lot, but they're not putting it in the right reporting um, terminology, language, structure to be able to under, be understood by the market. Or two, they're not aware that they're doing a lot. So for example, if you're in manufacturing and you've got initiatives under, uh, I came from manufacturing before, so under age old um, um, efforts like lean manufacturing, for example, those are, many, many of them are sustainability initiatives. And it might not be under the heading of sustainability at the moment, but I do encourage you to look throughout your organization to uncover the sustainability um, initiatives. So let me quickly in the next five minutes, just go through each of these, just so you know how to start, okay? So no plan, do tell. First phase in the knowing, two important things under awareness, step one awareness, that I really would like you to focus on if possible. 
is to number one, seek sufficient level of understanding. And I'm sure many of you already have um, a sufficient level of understanding for your board of directors and your management team. And mind you, they are the spokespeople ideally um, for the company from a sustainability perspective. Um, I have had companies have told me that, you know, they've been the, the top management does not yet have the sufficient, sufficient level of confidence to be able to talk about sustainability in the public realm. And that's where ideally um, you will seek that level of understanding. And secondly, very importantly, as mentioned, communicate it across your organization. In the setup, two key things to be done. One, setting up your sustainability governance structure. So there are three main um, hierarchical um, uh, components. So besides the board of directors that you report into, ideally there's a steering committee that's making decisions and providing direction. There's a sustainability working group who are, who, which comprises of um, typically heads of departments across the company to be able to, be able to, um, to engage in this conversation. And finally, and very importantly, a sustainability project management office. This could be a sustainability team, or if you're much smaller and you don't have a dedicated sustainability team, it could be, um, you know, uh, two halves of an FTE of your finance department, for example. So, but somebody whose job it is to actually make sure that this agenda is driven forward. And within this as well, I would encourage you to have an internal assurance um, component to ensure that all the data that you're collecting um, before it gets published does go through at least an internal assurance, if not external assurance as well. Conducting a baseline, this can be done via a survey, for example, for to every business unit to ensure that you know everything sustainability that is happening across your organization, whether or not it is recognized as such at the moment. Next phase, planning. So in planning, the first thing, and many of you asked about this, is about strategy. How do I strategize sustainability? All right, so first and foremost, think about the sustainability wave, okay? So you have to be very honest with your own company in terms of what your sustainability aspirations are. And this can be, this is oftentimes influenced either by personal characteristics within the management team, or it could be influenced by market conditions. It could be influenced by stakeholders, key stakeholders like your investors or regulators um, that are actually pushing you towards it. But really think about what kind of a company do you want to build ultimately? Do you want a company that is um, that basically embodies sustainability? Or do you want to just ensure that you are basically um, compliant and you're happy for your competitors to kind of be the sustainability champions in your industry. Secondly, determine how fast you want to achieve this aspiration. So you could um, you could either go through it in a big bang approach, which is very um, aggressive and to you know internally and not in in um, kind of revamping your business processes and ensuring that you're taking all the right steps externally with the media, for example, could be a phased approach. Or it could be a very slow emergent approach where you kind of um, take, take a step back to see how the rest of the market is progressing. Of course, there are risks associated with that. Thirdly, build your sustainability strategy, framework, roadmap, and targets. And unfortunately, we probably don't have time to go into, I know your question was around how do I do this? So here, what I would really encourage you to do is go back to your basic business strategy components. Go back to um, you know, your, your business uh, strategy frameworks, the house framework, for example, um, you know, which is a very simple entryway into this, but really go back to the business basics to be able to craft the sustainability strategy, keeping in mind both your financial uh, impact and your non-financial impact as well alongside the strategy, and in fact, helping you to build your strategy are two things that are very, very key in terms of actions. One is building your materiality matrix and um, do research more if you haven't heard of um, uh, building a materiality matrix as such. But what it basically means is helping you identify what are the most important business issues in your company today um, both from your point of view, as well as your stakeholders' point of view. And also use that to plan your stakeholder engagement. In the do, in terms of implementation and tracking, um, what I would encourage you to do is 
align your company to the SDGs if you haven't already. Select a reporting framework as a guide. Here I've given an example of GRI and determine which evaluation framework. Remember the two buckets we spoke of earlier is applicable to you, whether FTSE for good is applicable or not. If it's not, at this point in time, if you're an SME looking to start out, here's what I would propose. Pick five indicators from GRI as starters, and this could be as simple as reporting your energy usage, reporting your training hours. They are very, very simple indicators in there. Pick five and start building upon it and upon it and upon it. And that's how you begin to track your implementation from an indicator perspective, but also begin to hold people accountable for it. I'm going two minutes past my promised time, Tobias. Sorry about that. For the last slide that I have, which is around the tell. And this is extremely important reporting. You want to be able to showcase what you're doing, not because you are tooting your own horn, but because you want to also ensure that you're getting full credit for your efforts and you're inspiring the rest of the market to follow suit. So first step, build your sustainability report and three levels of sustainability reporting. First, ensuring it's compliant. Second, that it's fundamentally good. And third, that it's a leading report. And you can see examples of this all over the place. Early approaches include ESG elements, kick off a few initiatives, and as I mentioned, select key global disclosures. Now in storytelling, what I would encourage you to do is to make sustainability your brand story. And do be very, very careful about greenwashing at this point. All right. And with that, um, I will personally thank you very much. Um, I will be handing over to Tobias after this. If you have any questions, um, feel free to follow up with me. And with that, I will, I'm about three minutes behind time. Um, and let me stop. Oops, stop sharing my. I think I took over already. Imagine. You have. Okay, excellent. I it's, think it's my screen already. It's the exact same slide. So I know, I know, I know. I it was Sorry, like... that handover was too seamless. No, it was um, seamless. Excellent. Thank you. And over to you, Tobias. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. And um, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for joining today. Um, now you have another Guaylo who tells you how to become greener and, and, and more sustainable. But I promise you, I look at it um, from, from two perspectives. I've been uh, living in Malaysia for uh, over 18 years, or as Margie put it so nicely, several decades. Um, and uh, I spent most of my time actually working in the sustainability space as a consultant or as an entrepreneur, setting up a renewable energy business in the Philippines, working in a sustainable forest plantation in Sabah, but also now largely go back to consulting and helping uh, local companies to um, uh, work on the sustainability um, activities, being it in the circular economy, economy, helping a company to be plastic neutral, or being it for climate change, for carbon neutrality. But without too much more information about myself, let us jump into the content of the last session. And if at the end of the day, I want you to take two things away, it's that you know how to calculate your greenhouse gas footprint, that you actually know what are the greenhouse gas emissions of your specific company, and that you have the first ideas what to do about it, actually. So hopefully we can become very specific when it comes to um, these two steps. And um, before we go into it, I also would like to take a very short poll just to get a feeling, understanding how experienced you are, whether you're all experts and we could end the session basically now, or whether you are more at a beginner, meaning that you don't fully understand yet why and how your company could calculate the greenhouse gas emissions, or maybe you're a bit more advanced that you understand uh, the global need. I mean, uh, Margie has explained it to a large extent. Maybe you're quite proficient already. You, have, you know some of the concepts, you know scope one, two, and three emissions. And you just need to get going now, I uh, need the impulse to start calculating it, or you're really an expert. And Margie, if you could show the, um, uh, the poll one so that everybody could vote. And I shall try to adjust the, uh, the answer or the, the discussion of the presentation along the way. So by now the beginners are still leading, but the advanced guys are slowly catching up. Can we have a few more answers? 10 more seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
one and a half, zero and a half. Okay. Um, Marty, are you sharing the results? So. Yep, everyone can see it now. Okay, wonderful. So as you can see, um, okay, we are still we have uh, a few experts here, but I think the the majority of the audience are beginners or advanced. So we will try to cover some of the basic concepts in detail. If they are too basic, let me know. If you have clarification questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, um, if I see them, I will reply. Otherwise, the team might alert me to it. Um, but then let's dive into the content. Um, Marty, the screen there again? Yep, all gone. Okay, cool. And I guess you can see my screen again, um, where we talk now about how do you think about um, um, emissions, about greenhouse gas emissions. And firstly, let's start with a very, 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 very basic. What are greenhouse gas emissions, right? Because there might be different words, different abbreviations, different names for gases flying around that we talk about. But in essence, there are six to seven gases that we consider greenhouse gas emissions that basically are responsible for the global warming effect for climate, uh, climate change. For all practical purposes, you can say you just focus on carbon dioxide and maybe methane. A lot of the other gases, the hydrofluorocarbons, they come from um, uh, either from cooling supply chains or from uh, large scale um, coal-fired power plants. So most of these you can ignore. Maybe some of you, if you're in the agricultural sector, you might have nitrous oxide emissions. But for all practical purposes, I think most of you will have only carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions, or methane, CH4 emissions. Still one more concept or word to be aware of is that since these gases have different um, impacts on the climate, some have a stronger impact, some have a less strong impact. This impact is called the global warming potential. And since some gases have a stronger global warming potential, we always translate it back into what would be the equivalent of one ton CO2e. So even if you have a lot of methane, at the end of the day, you wouldn't account for how many tons of methane you have. You will translate it all into CO2e or CO2 equivalent. And don't worry, typically you don't have to do the calculation. There's always some smart Excel tool somewhere that does it for you. But you just need to be aware if somebody asks you about the global warming potential, it means that some gases have a higher, uh, worse impact on the climate than others. And especially if you have some of these hydrofluorocarbons that can have a tremendously higher amount. The, the effect that can be a few thousand times the impact of a ton of CO2. So then second point to be very, uh, to be aware of is that when we think about greenhouse gas emissions of your company, we think about it in three scopes or three steps. And the first scope, and you don't need to read the fine print, we will discuss it in much more detail. But the first scope is really the emissions that your company or the operations of your company very direct, directly cause by burning stuff and by that I mean by, by burning materials in a, in, a, in a kiln or in a boiler or in a power plant or by the vehicles, by the mobile vehicles that uh, drive around as part of your operation. The second scope, and again, also we'll discuss that in more detail, is the kind of emissions that buy, you buy into your company. By buying basically electricity from Tenaga or from a different electricity provider, you basically, with the electricity, with a kilowatt hour, you also buy the greenhouse gas footprint of that kilowatt hour. And that is still quite straightforward, it's quite simple. The scope three is really the hard part. That's the most complex part, but we need to talk about it because a lot of the emissions are scope three emissions, what we call indirect emissions, which are emissions that your company has because you purchase goods, you purchase materials, you purchase capital goods, cars, trucks, because these products are shipped to you via containers, via airplanes, et cetera. And once you have bought all this and created your products, when you send the product to market, you also cause indirect emissions, meaning by you sending out your products, your, your, your cookie, your snacks, um, your, um, your light bulbs, your microwaves to the market, you also cause emissions. And um, this is one of the more complex parts. We'll talk about scope three in detail later on. But first, scope one. Scope one is relatively simple because scope one direct emissions are from sources that you control. They're controlled by the, your company. As a result, they're fairly easy to monitor, right? And it includes emissions that you cause by producing your own electricity or producing steam uh, or cool air if you have a cooling needs. Um, and typically, if you produce it yourself, you have an own boiler, you have a combined heat and power plant, uh, you have a genset. And since you have it yourself, you know what 
fuel you put in there, whether it's a fossil fuel like coal or natural gas or heavy fuel oil, or whether it's even a renewable fuel, meaning um, uh, biogenic fuel, meaning wood residues or palm oil kernel shell or metocarp fiber, empty fruit bunches, etc. But since you know it, um, you know quite exactly what you throw in there. Um, it's quite easy actually to calculate what is the greenhouse gas emissions caused by this um, combustion. Um, you might have um, emissions from the process that you do yourself. That depends a bit on um, the process. I mean, we had a few service companies here. As a legal service company, you typically don't have any of that. But if you are cement kiln, of course, you have process emissions. If you are, I think we had one chemical manufacturer here. Depending on what you do, you might have um, process emissions. Waste processing often has methane emissions from the waste process itself, etc. Or if you're Petronas, of course, with huge chemical uh, petrochemical facilities, you have huge uh, process emissions. If you transport materials around in your compound yourself, right? If you use a truck, a forklift, a bobcar, whatever you have in your compound, um, that is uh, also counted as one uh, emissions. Except you don't count the, the emissions of your employees commuting to your site. That is not part of that. But if you are basically um, uh, a uh, cleaning company that is transporting staff to uh, uh, an office to clean it there and transport it back. Uh, this kind of transport emissions could be part of your scope one emissions. And lastly, if you are in the refrigerator, if you have ref refrigeration processes, if there are any leaks from the refrigeration process, even if the amounts are very small, since these gases have a very potent impact on the um, uh, uh, very high uh, greenhouse uh, warming potential. Um, even small leaks actually should be accounted for here because um, of that large impact they can have. So that's scope one. Within your control, within your compound, within your facilities, fairly easy to control. Secondly, scope two, also fairly easy to um, control because it's largely the amount of electricity that we buy. And in Malaysia, you basically have only three choices, right? Either you are in Peninsula Malaysia, then the greenhouse gas intensity of the kilowatt hour is determined by Tenaga, Tenaga uh, National. If you are in Sarawak, it's determined by Sarawak Energy or Saba, Saba Electricity Board. And they basically, of, since they use fossil fuels to a large extent for the production of electricity, every kilowatt hour they sell to you has a certain CO2 or greenhouse gas um, intensity. So you literally, it's as easy as looking at your electricity bill and multiplying the kilowatt hours or megawatt hours with the amount of uh, with the CO2 intensity. We talk about that later. There might be some uh, rare cases where you also buy steam or cool air from a third party. So there are a few district cooling plants in Malaysia, but very few. But if you happen to be buying from them cool air, or if you're buying steam from a neighboring facility, you would need to account for the greenhouse gas emissions of that steam or of that cool air also in your scope too. So far, I hope all clear, and so far it's pretty easy um, because scope two emissions um, are still fairly easy to understand. The real tricky part is scope three, but it's also a super important part because ultimately scope three is how we pass emissions along the value chain, right? How you buy it from uh, your suppliers and how you sell it, how you give it to your customers. And as Margie explained earlier on, as more and more companies globally, not only in Europe, but also in Asia, um, in, in the Americas and Africa, as more and more companies are saying they want to be carbon, net carbon zero, they want to reduce their carbon emissions. For a lot of these companies, their emissions come from their suppliers. So they need to ask their suppliers, what is, your, what is carbon intensity of your ton of steel, or of your ton of cement, or of the car that you produce, or of the snack that you produce, right? because um, it's a large part of their emissions. And so as a result, also you need to understand what are your emissions in scope three. And as I said, on the one hand, there are what we call the upstream emissions. The emissions that you buy because you buy them from your supplier. And uh, we had a snack manufacturer here, but right? if you're a snack manufacturer, your purchase goods and materials will, for example, be the flour that you buy. If you use any fat, the palm oil or butter that you use, maybe milk powder, um, um, the plastic packaging that you use afterwards to package the snack, all these products, the raw materials that you buy, they come with a certain carbon footprint. If you're then a construction company, it might be cement and steel, right? And in your manufacturing, you will capital goods, right? If you use an um, uh, excavator or a crane, right? All these have a huge embedded carbon footprint um, that come with the caterpillar that you buy. And to get the materials to you, there's a whole transportation chain. There might be waste 
generated in the operations, and especially if it's organic waste with a, a producing methane, that can be quite significant. And here you would also count business travel for employees commuting to your facility or for your sales staff flying all over Southeast Asia or even the world right, to sell a service. And then there are the downstream emissions that occur from you sending the product to market. So if I now have produced my snacks, right, and if I am happy, lucky enough that I sell them all over the world, or at least in Southeast Asia, uh, selling these products and sending them to the market also comes with a, uh, with a greenhouse gas footprint. Or if you see the gardenia trucks driving around Malaysia, delivering the bread, right? These trucks come with a greenhouse gas footprint. If you happen to produce a cooled product, right? Ice cream or fish or chicken or ice cubes, right? You have a, cool, a truck with a cooling system, which needs even more um, uh, fuels and thereby more greenhouse gas emissions. And probably the most tricky one, but the hardest to get your head around, but also one of the very, very important ones is this emission from the use of the sold product. Because if I produce a product that afterwards still produces a user's energy for the next 30 years, to some extent, these emissions are also part of my scope three. So if I build a house now as a real estate company, as a property developer, and this house is incredibly energy inefficient, I cannot put a solar panel on top, um, the house needs huge amounts of air con because they, it can't be cooled. Those emissions become actually are your uh, scope three emissions, right? So the other way around, if you build an incredibly energy efficient house, right, uh, you can actually reduce the emissions from the use of your sold product. It might be more intuitive for a fridge, right, or for uh, air con if you build, if you produce um, energy efficient products, energy efficient um, fridges, uh, the emissions from use of your sold product are lower. And also the disposal of the sold product depending on uh, what it is, can have a larger or smaller footprint. If you manage to make sure it's recycled and uh, materials are covered, of course, then the end of life uh, emissions are much lower. So this was the conceptual part, right? We have different emissions in terms of uh, the different greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, carbon dioxide, and methane being the most important one for you. And we have the three scopes, scope one, two, and three. And as I said earlier on, if there's one thing that I want you to be able to do afterwards is to go home, or not to go home, you're up in the office, to stay in the office and to start calculating what are the greenhouse gas emissions of your company. Um, and question from Karina, very, very good question, right? How do I measure scope three emissions since they're outside of my control and lack of data, right? And that is in speed the most difficult part because for some areas you might have default factors, right? That you could, um, say a ton of cement has X uh, kilograms of CO2E. But in most cases, you actually would need to ask your supplier, right? Uh, so that's why you also see the CO2, uh, the scope three emissions often not covered in standardized tools, like what I show afterwards. Um, like the greenhouse gas protocol um, uh, is often the, the uh, scope three emissions are not explicitly covered there for all areas, because even if you buy a ton of cement, right? If you buy it from YTL or from Hume cement, the uh, CO2 emission intensity might be different. So you will literally would have to ask your suppliers um, for the uh, emissions. But that's also why we are stressed so much that you need to get, start getting your head around it because most likely you are a supplier of someone. So most likely this company will ask you sooner or later, what is the carbon footprint of your product? But there is no easy way around it. You need to ask your suppliers basically, except for transportation, et cetera. And we'll show that in a second. Karina, I hope that uh, answers uh, part of your question, uh, but we'll cover some of it in more detail also in a minute when we look at uh, scope one, two, and three in the data, uh, activity data. So, but ideally, you can follow these very simple six steps where you say, in the first step, I need to define still a little bit the boundaries, right? What is my factory limit? What is in, what is out? I need to identify what are the sources of emissions. I need to start collecting data. You can't get around it. You need to have some activity data. Then you can start calculating, and this can be quite easy. Don't be scared. It's actually much easier than you might think for some of them. You sum it all up, add it up. As Margie said, ideally you have a part-time support of your accounting or finance team, and you analyze it. And ideally, of course, at the end, you do something about it, meaning re you reduce your emissions and you make a plan how to reduce it as part of the um, overall strategy that Margie mentioned earlier on. So but firstly, defining the emission boundaries. It's still important to do it up front because otherwise you have questions afterwards, what is in, what is out. And um, quite, quite simply, there are three ways how to, um, how to define the boundaries. 
You can do it by equity share, meaning you maybe have a joint venture, you hold 50%, another person holds 50%. So you might say each of us take 50% of the uh, emissions. But to be honest, I think that's more the case for really large companies. If Petronas and Shell co-own a huge LNG plant and this LNG plant has huge emissions, then they might say, okay, by equity share, we split it, right? And you get 50%, I get 50%. In most cases for you, I think what will be relevant is for operational control. We simply think, okay, which part of the production and manufacturing is under my control. So I account for that. In one case, I had brothers, they were running two factories side by side, but they were deeply interlinked. So that both factories, both Sandra and Behatz are basically one, one group that is in our control, right? So it's within these two companies, it's two Sandra and Behatz. It could be financial control if you, um, um, if you um, maybe have contractors or contract farming, et cetera, where you have a strong control over the suppliers with a financial incentive. But for all practical purposes, I think by the operational control, if you're an SME, you look at what can you influence, what do you own, what is within your factory limits, et cetera. That is typically where you would draw the boundary and account for all of that within as scope uh, one and two. And for the other products, you get in and out as scope three. Then you still need to identify the emissions. And um, we covered that, I think, in a um, reasonable level of detail. We said scope one stationary or mobile emissions or emissions from combustion of stationary and mobile um, um, facilities in your, in your plant, meaning boilers or uh, moving vehicles within your plant or within your activities. Scope two, the emissions from the electricity or the heat or the cool air that you buy. And scope three is upstream and downstream emissions. And we'll still talk about them a little bit more in detail when we look into the activity data. But before we go there, so activity data, um, before we go into the scope three, in order to quantify it for each and every source of emission, you need to understand, of course, um, the, the volume metric, right? How much fuel did I use? Um, or how many kilometers did I drive, et cetera. And for scope one, it's again, quite easy, right? Because um, if you have stationary combustion, you use some kind of fuel, being it a fossil fuel, being it natural gas or LPG or diesel, or being it a renewable fuel. And even if it's a renewable fuel, you still capture it afterwards because the renewable fuel, it will be uh, not accounted for your greenhouse gas emissions because it's considered renewable. But you still would account for okay, what is really the amount of uh, fuel that I used in my stationary power plant, right? You will do the same thing for the mobile combustion. For mobile combustion, you probably, if the, um, equipment is, or if the, the vehicles are within your compound, you probably anyway have some um, way to keep track of your fuel consumption, right? Uh, that you have a tank for diesel uh, or gasoline, um, or if it's a fleet that is driving outside, you probably keep track by kilometer, or you have a, a, a card, uh, a special card to um, keep track of the amount of fuel pumped. But in any cases, you're probably monitoring this anyway, right? You're monitoring how many kilometers do my cars drive, or how many liters of fuel do all my vehicles and my fleet consume? And the last one, as I mentioned, if you have a cooling supply chain, then if there are any leakages of this uh, cooling supply, then this will be important to capture. But in principle, number the first two you probably capture already because you pay for that fuel in some shape or form. Scope two is even easier. As I said, if you only consume electricity, right? all you do is you take your Tenaga bills for the year, add them all up in terms of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours and multiply them with the CO2E intensity of that kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. If you have uh, 200, if you're a retailer and you have 200 outlets, then you need to do it 200 times, right? But it's not more complicated than taking 200 bills, adding them up and multiplying them with the CO2 intensity. Of course, if some of your outlets are in Peninsula and some in Sarawak, then you use the uh, CO2 intensities of Sarawak Energy and of Tenaga but it's not more complicated than that. And only back to Karina's question when it comes to scope three, there it's getting a bit, um, a bit more difficult. And again, the good news is if um, the, the rule of thumb by the um, science-based target, if your, um, um, your scope three emissions are likely less than 40%, then you might not even worry about them right now. But if they are more than 40%, you definitely should quantify them. But how do you know whether they are more or less than 40% if you haven't even quantified them. So just looking into comparable companies that have already registered with a science-based target initiative gives you a good idea 
and if comparable companies have said that they have more than 40% of emissions from scope one, then also you are highly likely to have more emissions, more than 40% coming from scope, uh, scope three. And um, there, I only showed a few options right now, but de facto you have 15 different sources of emissions in scope, uh, scope three that you need to, to worry about or that you should quantify. Um, ideally, of course, um, um, you have a certain hypothesis. You know where your emissions are coming from. As your company, it's the SME. You probably have a pretty good understanding, right? What is your biggest uh, cost factor in the company other than human resources, other than salary and wages, right? What are your biggest suppliers? Those will probably also be your bigger bucket, biggest buckets in terms of CO2 emissions. So you don't need to now count for all these 15 kind of um, activities exactly what is the emission of the last pencil that I bought. The last pencil is irrelevant, right? But if you are, for example, um, a service provider, an accounting and consulting firm, then most likely actually, and if you have a lot of uh, visits to, um, to, to clients, et cetera, then the main sources of emissions might be your business travel and your employee commute and maybe a little, and the electricity is already covered in scope two, right? So in scope three, that's maybe what you have to do, right? Business travel, employee commuting, right? Um, because uh, if legal, if accountants or lawyers burn stuff, typically something has gone wrong, right? So you can be quite hypothesis driven based on what you know about your company. If you are a construction company, I think we have one real estate company here, a construction company or a property developer, you already know, right? Within your purchased goods, I mean, the cement and the steel that you buy is probably the two single biggest um, or two of the biggest uh, cost items in the terms of the materials, right? If you are a construction company, also you probably have uh, equipment, right? You might have an excavator, you might have trucks um, that actually are capital goods that have an embedded um, um, CO2 footprint. Um, waste for construction companies might be slightly less. And then what I mentioned earlier on, the use of your sold product actually should also become your scope three emissions. But in the first step, what you will do, you will ask if you're a construction company, your steel supplier, what is actually the CO2 intensity of one ton of steel that you buy, your cement supplier, what is actually one ton, the CO2 footprint of uh, one ton of cement. And they are also in the process of finding that out right now, right? So uh, you might not get an immediate answer for all of them. And in that case, you can use with the default factors that exist for now, um, but everybody's trying to get their head around basically right now, what is the CO2 intensity of their product? If you are an equipment manufacturer, like uh, I think we have one, we said there was one automotive manufacturer here or electric goods, quite similar, right? It will be the materials that you buy, it will be the machinery that you use. Um, if you have to send your product to a market, right? If you have long transport distances, then sending the product to the market, uh, using of the product, if it's uh, automotive, of course, the question of how much fuel, how fuel efficient is your vehicle, and also the end of life treatment of the product that is being uh, taken back and recycled afterwards. And a financial holding company will be completely different, right? Then it will be again about business travel and free commuting financial uh, assets, where are the emissions coming from. So in either case, we would always encourage you don't, don't try now to take stock of all your emission sources first. I mean, don't count the emissions of the pencil in each stack of paper. Focus on the sources that are most likely the biggest contributors for your company, which you intuit intuitively know because they are also probably your biggest uh, cost items and your biggest um, uh, supplier. And once you have done that, then you only need to do the calculation, right? Um, meaning the activity data, you multiply it with emission factors and you can do it manually, right? Um, you could basically uh, find out what are the CO2 emissions of a liter of diesel or as, um, as Karina already said, there are nice tools and as she the greenhouse gas protocol is also my preferred tool. If you use the greenhouse gas protocol, it's not Malaysia specific yet. It's a, it's a global tool, but the emissions from a liter of diesel are more or less the same, no matter where you burn it, right? Uh, they are the same, um, except for the sulfur content maybe. So literally download the Excel tool that we mentioned here at the bottom. It's a simple Excel file. It's reasonably con uh, intuitive, right? And it allows you to say, at least for scope one and a little bit of scope three, I can calculate my, um, my mobile emissions and my stationary emissions. 
And you literally download the Excel file, it's super intuitive. You click on scope one and it tells you, you need to clean this data. And don't be uh, shocked if it says fuel efficiency of the vehicle. It does not mean you need to find now whether a 10 year old structure, what is the fuel efficiency? The tool is so simple. You just put in the, this is just for your record, right? The year and the truck that you have. You say what kind of fuel it uses. You say, is it light duty truck? Is it a heavy duty truck? Is it a gasoline a passenger car? You just say what kind of vehicle it is, right? You say, okay, how do I take stock of the activity data? Is it by liter or is it by kilometer? And maybe for the, the trucks, right, that you, um, uh, the fleet of trucks that you run, you might actually keep track of it by liters. But the uh, car of the managing director, um, if he pays for it himself for the liters, maybe you only keep track of the kilometers. So you can choose how do I keep track of the activity data? And uh, you add in the amount and the tool automatically tells you this is the CO2 or CO2 equivalent footprint of your vehicles. And it's calculated for CO2 and uh, CH4 and even nitrous oxide, laughing gas. But don't worry about it. The tool automatically calculates according to the greenhouse, uh, the, the global warming potential, what is the CO2 equivalent of my vehicle fleet? So it's literally as simple as that, right? Download that tool and ask your accountant or your team member who has access to activity data to key it in once or to see which information to collect. And the only part that you cannot use of this tool, you might've seen there was also scope two purchase electricity, but this one you cannot use yet. Um, yeah, the greenhouse gas tool is free. Uh, you can download it on the Excel file, on the, on the link that I put down there uh, for Kyrill. But just notice it's not Malaysia specific yet, right? So MGTC um, is currently working on a Malaysia specific tool. So the Malaysian Green Technology Corporation is working on a Malaysia specific tool. But really the one Malaysia specific topic you need to be aware of is the CO2 intensity of the electricity. In that tool, you will only find the Quebec and Canadian and American um, electricity grids, which are relevant for us. But really, if you are in Tena if you are in uh, Tenaga territory in Peninsular Malaysia, this is the CO2 intensity of the grid for 2019, I think. And if you go on the homepage, maybe by now they've also published the 2020 CO2 intensity yet. Okay. Um, Sarawak uh, Electricity, same thing. They publish it for Saba Electricity. I haven't found it right now, but I also haven't asked them. But basically all you would do is you check how many megawatt hours or how many kilowatt hours of electricity did all my, uh, all my facilities consume, add it up and multiply it with 0 0.57. And you have the scope two emissions of your, of your company. As I said, if you have cooling or heating, you need to do an extra step, but I think it's very, very few of you. And then of course, in the tool, I mean, this now I simplified it a bit, right? But if you key in this data, it will tell you what is a stationary combustion, mobile combustion, what is purchase, purchase electricity. I needed to overwrite now the Canadian numbers there, but it's, it's very simple. You just multiply, as I said, your megawatt hours with the Tenaga footprint. And the one thing, back to Karina's question, unfortunately, in this tool, only the gray lines, you can actually key in data and get data. When it comes to scope three, for upstream transportation and distribution, business travel and employee commuting, you can key it in, right? And you can basically, um, um, calculate those scope three emissions. But uh, for purchase goods, you cannot do that because even a ton of cement, if, if you buy it from YTL or for Lafarge Holstem, the CO2 footprint is very different, right? Or an excavator, right? If you buy it, uh, the CO2 footprint will be very different. So there you will not get around actually asking your suppliers for the CO2 intensity of the materials that you buy. And then, of course, you still need to analyze them a bit. Um, the most important thing is you should still translate into carbon intensity, meaning we have a law, we have a law firm here, a legal firm, and we have, uh, um, I think it was a consulting firm and um, an engineering firm. Of course, it doesn't make sense to calculate for you a CO2 intensity for per ton of cement, right? You will need to calculate it per employee, per full-time equivalent, per person, per staff, right? But if we have a construction company here that is building now uh, residential real estate, you would say, what is the embedded carbon per square meter or per square foot of um, building space, of a housing space that I've built, right? Or if we have a cookie company, a snack company we had, you said you will calculate it per production volume, per ton of uh, snacks, what is the CO2 intensity of my snacks, right? So you need to translate it into a unit that makes sense for your company. 
And you should, of course, review the major sources of the emissions, which you automatically do as you calculate them. You will automatically see, right, where are your emissions actually coming from? And while doing it, you will identify what are the opportunities to reduce it, right? If you're currently burning um, coal in a boiler, you might as well try to find out, right, whether you can retrofit the boiler and get um, palm kernel shell from a neighboring palm oil mill, right? Or if you see your scope two emissions are very large, you might look at your roof, right? Can you actually uh, install solar panels, photovoltaic solar panels, benefit from the net metering uh, facilities of the Malaysian government and reduce your CO2 intensity? Um, is it that your company's uh, boss with the S-class Mercedes produces too much emissions and you convince him to get a, a hybrid Toyota afterwards, right? So you would see where are the opportunities to actually reduce it and you set, set yourself targets. I mean, you are SMEs, right? So you wouldn't now set yourself a big science-based target, maybe like a, like a Petronas or like a cement company, but still you should set yourself targets and then analyze and report them. And we have one garment manufacturer here, right? So if you um, are a garment manufacturer, you might do it like Levi Strauss. And if, if you communicate it, like what Barty said, if you need to communicate it, the work that you've done, you might also make it nicer, make sure it looks nice. Um, we had a, the snack manufacturer here. You could also, if you need to communicate it as part of your sustainability reporting, you make it nice, break it down according to the source of emissions. If you're not asked to report it to anybody, right? If it's for internal consumption, it might look as simple as that, right? But even as simple as that, if you discuss this within your company and you see that suddenly the end of life treatment of your, pla of your, uh, of your product and the use of the sold product is the two single biggest sources of emissions, then you will have the discussion, how do I make my product more energy efficient? And how do I make sure that these products are responsibly treated at the end of life, right? Is it a take back scheme, is it a recycling scheme, et cetera. And that brings me to the summary. Right, that uh, I added the seventh step here. Of course, once you have done the analysis and the reporting, our whole objective of that is that afterwards you find the ways to reduce your greenhouse gas emission footprint. And we want to make sure you are prepared that you start doing that as soon as possible, that as and when somebody asks you about your greenhouse gas footprint, you can already very confidently say, yep, I know what is step one, what is scope one, is scope two. Scope three, you still need to wrap your head around it, but you're on the way so that um, you are rather proactive and get your head around it as early as possible. That brings me to the end of the question, uh, uh, end of the session, but I think there are still two questions. Um, yes, can you share a little bit about voluntary carbon trading? Um, so voluntary carbon trading um, um, would allow you to buy emission certificates and to reduce, to offset your emissions if you cannot offset them within your, uh, within your value chain yourself. And I think that is still a good solution for the next 10 years or so. But ultimately, if you look where the world is running right now, everybody sees we need to be net carbon neutral by 2050. So the focus will be more and more focusing on how do you offset the emissions within your supply chain, right? Because if everybody needs to be carbon neutral, we cannot all buy offsets somewhere. Um, the, the offset, the uh, voluntary carbon trading offsets are limited, right? So I think it's a, it's an inter, a good interim solution, especially for um, sectors like airlines, which for them, it's impossible to go carbon neutral overnight, right? Because the planes are not made to combust anything else but um, uh, that aviation fuel that now. And you can't produce all this aviation fuel right away with a, a renewable source. So some industries really, really need it. But uh, for other industries, uh, they need to find ways to resolve it as soon as possible within the supply chain. Um, Casey, will the presentation made available? I think so. Um, I might have made slight changes, but I... Um, can send the changes to the organizer. I think I covered all the questions. Any other or any other questions? Okay, then I think that brings me to the end of my session. Um, passing back to the organizer for the final words. So. Thank you so much, Margie and Tobias, for the super insightful session. I hope that everyone has gained more knowledge through this workshop, as well as understand how to incorporate sustainability practices within your business. 
So today's session is coming to an end. And on behalf of UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, and our knowledge partner, Capital Markets Malaysia, I would like to thank everyone one again for making time in your busy schedule just to join us. But before I end this, I would also like to invite everyone to come join us in our other available workshops throughout this week and also our upcoming event, which is the Go ESG ASEAN 2021 Virtual Summit, which is happening on 24th and 25th November. Once you sign up for the event, you will get an access to the month-long virtual exhibition. I'll be sharing the link to the event in the chat box below, and I hope to see you there. With that, I wish you all to stay safe and have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you so much, everyone.